All right, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for critical HR updates from the National Labor Relations Board. I'm Jackie Petrostelli, the Marketing Specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full-service human capital management services company offering a suite of products and services including HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance. We support our clients with cutting-edge technical solutions as well as proactive, reliable service and deep HR and payroll expertise. MP is wired for HR and helps clients succeed by tying their operations to their business goals. Your presenter today is MP's VP of Client and HR Services, Paul Corellis. Paul has over a decade of experience in the HR consulting space, working with businesses of all sizes and industries. Paul and his team of certified HR professionals at MP assist clients with compliance, training, and full circle HR guidance and support. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic off to Paul. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie, and, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is this is a topic I you know I don't think we've we've covered specifically um, throughout our webinar series over the years, but um, I think it's an important one. It's the National Labor Relations Board is a a governmental body that I don't think gets the same amount of press as the Department of Labor, or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, but um, really does have a lot of sway and influence when it comes to uh, employer law and labor law, both um, public sector and private sector. So uh, we'll take a little bit of time today um, to, to discuss that in more detail. Um, and certainly if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put those in the, the chat box and we'll do our best to address those at the end. Uh, quick legal disclaimer, this training is educational and informational from a HR best practices perspective. Um, we are not attorneys. Please don't construe anything today as legal advice. And, and also just another quick disclaimer, you know, the more we get into the weeds when we talk about governmental bodies and political parties and nominations and confirmations and things like that, you know, uh, we're, we're not here to take a political stance one way or the other. We, we really just want to present the facts, present what's going on and, um, and certainly do our best to, to help our, our clients navigate uh, the various challenges that, that come up through through regulation and, and things like that. Um, but we, we do our best to, to stay out of stay out of the fray and just do what we can to help out everybody on the call today. Okay, so in terms of what we're going to talk about, first we'll start off with some breaking news, some of it related to to the main objectives of today and, and some that's a little bit separate. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the NLRB. You know, what, what's its makeup? Why was it created? Um, what its purpose is? We'll then talk about I mean, the current National Labor Relations Board um, anticipated agenda, both kind of what they've said in remarks recently about what they're gonna tackle. And then also just kind of using a bit of a crystal ball to, to take some educated guesses about other items that, that might be reviewed and, and ruled on by the current NLRB. Um, we're also going to talk about the PRO Act. So you may or may not have heard about that, but that's a piece of legislation that um, just passed the House this week and is on to the Senate um, and, and has a lot to do with labor relations and um, unionization and a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today. We'll talk about impact that's related from other governmental departments. And again, should you have any questions, feel free to pop those in and we'll, we'll do our best to respond to those at the end. So first bit of breaking news, as you almost certainly probably heard, around this time yesterday afternoon, um, the House and Senate did, did come to agreement on a new stimulus bill and, and it has passed both houses. So it now moves on to President Biden's desk. Um, from what I read this morning, he's expected to sign that tomorrow, so Friday. Um, and then it will, uh, the wheels will get into motion. So with something that just passed within the last 24 hours, we're still obviously taking some time to study and examine the bill and, and come up with our, our proper guidance on it, both myself and other members of our, of our HR team. But rest assured, we will have full analysis on this and, and do have a, a webinar coming up on this topic. So we'll be devoting a full hour to the new stimulus bill and how it may impact employers. But before that, and just based on some of the high level stuff that we do know, just wanted to touch upon a, a few key items that specifically may affect businesses and, and employers. 
um, and, and really some stuff that may not be capturing the headlines in the news and in the paper and things like that, because you know, obviously the focus to the general public are the, the $1,400 stimulus payments, the child tax credits and things like that. But um, there's also a lot of employment impacting stuff in there. So first of which is, uh, and I've seen conflicting numbers between 85% and 100%, but I do believe it, it finalized as 100%. So there is gonna be subsidy for uh, COBRA payments for employees who are who uh, lost eligibility or lost their jobs due to the pandemic. Uh, it looks like, uh, for those of you who remember, there were COBRA subsidies in place during uh, the recession a number of years ago. Uh, and those were done a little bit differently where the subsidies were on the employer side. It looks like the subsidies this time around, and again, we, we still need to look at it, so don't take this as gospel, but it appears based on my first pass at reading it is that instead these subsidies are gonna be to the employee through tax credits rather than through the employer. So hopefully it won't be too much of an administrative burden on employers. They've got enough on their plates right now. Um, but it, it does appear that there were, will be COBRA subsidies for uh, workers who were negatively affected by the pandemic. Uh, there is also going to be an extension of the FFCRA program. So Families First Coronavirus uh, Relief Act, um, sometimes also known as COVID leave. So this was the, the program that's been in place was in place mandatorily uh, in 2020 and then uh, an optional extension of it uh, through the end of this quarter, through the end of this month that provided job protected and paid leave for employees if they either um, were, were diagnosed with, with COVID-19, um, were mandated to isolate or quarantine because of exposure or suspected, uh, exposure to COVID-19, having to care for a sick family member related to COVID-19, or uh, also to care for a child when their daycare or school was closed and they um, were mandatory stuck at home uh, because of related COVID-19 related closures. So um, in the new stimulus bill, there is an extension that will begin April 1st and run through the end of the third quarter or the end of September. It does appear that there is going to be a new bucket of time, another two weeks available to employees under this program. And similarly, there will be reimbursements to the employer for the expenses of those wages through tax credits. So it should run fairly similar. It sounds like there might be some tweaks in terms of the maximum compensation that employees can receive and that employers can be refunded for through the, this new FFCRA. And the other, the big changes are that there are gonna be new, new eligibilities or, or new reasons why an employee would be allowed to take FFCRA leave. One of those will be um, to obtain a vaccine, so to, to leave work or, or miss work to obtain COVID-19 vaccination. And then also, uh, should there be some sort of side effects um, or illness or the need to miss work be after getting the vaccine, that that would be covered under this FFCRA program as well. Uh, and then in addition, they also looks like they're adding some non-discrimination rules, meaning that uh, really encouraging or, or mandating that employers provide the FFCRA leave uniformly and not uh, allow it for certain classes of employees and not others. Also going to be an ex extension of the very popular and very, very hot employee retention tax credit program. So the stimulus bill that was signed at the end of December opened it up for first and second quarter of this year. Uh, the new stimulus bill creates the ERTC program for third and fourth quarter as well. Uh, it looks like there may be some changes to eligibility and, and things of that nature with the third and fourth quarter ERTCs, um, but we'll definitely take a deep dive into that. And, um, and make sure that uh, we cover it in depth on the, on the related webinar. They also uh, portioned $25 billion specifically for the restaurant industry and the restaurant relief fund. They also added more money to the current round of PPP and added additional industries to be eligible um, that hadn't been previously. They've also pumped some more money into the emergency uh, disaster loan program, the EIDL loans, another $15 billion there. 
There's also uh, within that bill a, a pretty hefty, uh, maybe temporary, but a expansion of the Affordable Care Act. So increasing the amount and the eligibility for subsidies for workers who get coverage through the uh, health care exchanges. Um, also, um, kind of some motivations through funding to, I believe there are 12 states right now that did not do the Medicaid expansion program that's offered through the ACA. Um, so there are some incentives to try to get those states to, to hop on board with that. Uh, and then finally, it looks like there will be an increase in the maximum amount of FSA dependent care. So for employers who offer an FSA program, you probably know that for the dependent care portion, the portion that employees can use to uh, offset expenses for daycare and day camps and things like that. The limit has always been as far as as long as I can remember $5,000 and this would more than double that to $10,500. So again, much more on this to come in the coming weeks. Uh, we're wrapping our head around it and um, we'll be making uh, publishing more news pieces about this and then have a webinar dedicated to it as well. Another uh, piece of breaking news, and th this just came into my inbox today, um, but I, I felt it was important to add because it is relevant, especially about what we're talking about today. So the Department of Labor um, sent out a communication and a press release today formally stating, and this was kind of anticipated, but we weren't 100% sure that a couple of the, the rules that um, the outgoing Department of Labor under the Trump administration had put into place um, or recently enacted uh, are going to be rescinded by, by the new DOL. So the first of which is the independent contractor rule. So this is something where they publish the final rule really just ahead of um, the inauguration. I, it was the beginning of, I think the first week of January that they published the final rule. Um, it really set some guidelines to allow potentially more opportunity for companies to consider people performing work for them to be independent contractors. It really put a lot of emphasis uh, on the economic reality test, which uh, is a measurement to say, depending on how, how much uh, a worker is dependent upon uh, the other company helps determine whether or not there's an employee employer relationship there. So it uh, looks like they're gonna go back to the drawing board. I would expect that they'll make some, create their own set of guidelines and go through that same kind of rulemaking process where there'll be a proposed rule, there'll be a comment period, and then a final rule. So keep your eyes peeled for that. But for all intents and purposes, that uh, independent contractor rule that we talked about on a recent webinar a couple months ago uh, is going away. They also announced that they're formally rescinding the joint employer rule. So this is something that that was in place. It was enacted, I want to say, in February or March of last year. Uh, it was challenged in court, and certain pieces of it had already been thrown out by the courts. Um, but the DOL's action today will throw it out in full and, again, kind of bring them back to the drawing board to, to revisit this. So this has been a hot topic for a few years, this joint employer rule. And, and really where it comes into play is situations such as um, a franchise where, you know, how much does and I believe this was one of the specific cases that really started this movement was how much responsibility does say McDonald's Corporation have for their franchisees and their franchise locations for those franchise owners to be following various wage and hour and labor laws? Um, does, does corporate McDonald's bear any responsibility for the actions of their franchisees? So that, that's one example of the joint employer rule. Another place where we see it is in, is in staffing. So um, if a staffing agency sends a, a bunch of workers to, to work at a factory or to work at a Amazon distribution center, um, and they're not formally employees of Amazon, you know, how, how is that responsibility shared that, you know, while they're being supervised and given direction by Amazon, you know, who's responsible if there are labor law violations or safety violations, things, things of that nature. So uh, the, the previous Department of Labor set some some strict restrictions there and, and, and really paved the way for there to be fewer instances of a, a true joint employer relationship. Um, but again, that's going to be revisited and there'll be a, a new set of rules forthcoming, I'm sure. So um, in terms of keeping up with this, uh, 
stay tuned, stay on our mailing list if you're if you're with us, especially if you're with us for HR services. We'll keep you in the loop proactively and, and let you know how these things evolve. But um, these are two things to keep an eye on, especially if either of these scenarios apply to you. Either someone as someone who uses independent contractors and pays people via 1099, or if you're you're doing business um, with other businesses and kind of sharing employees or sending your employees to be under the direction of someone else or vice versa. If you're if you use staffing agencies or um, if you have people working within your facility that are being paid by someone else. So stay tuned. All right. So I think that's it for the breaking news. Let's let's dig into the main topic here. So the National Labor Relations Board, uh, and again, let's let's just do a, a brief background and kind of give you an idea of the history and how it came about. So the National Labor Relations Board, or the NLRB as I'll call it going forward, was established by Congress uh, in 1935 as, as part of the National Labor Relations Act. So at that time, you know, we were out of the Depression, the, the, the Fair Labor Standards Act was coming around and, you know, around that same vicinity, give, a, give or take a decade or so. Uh, but there was a lot of focus and a lot of tumult over employee rights, you know, whether that be stuff under the FLSA, overtime, minimum wage, things of that nature, um, and, and then just kind of the overall employee experience. So uh, what was happening was certain jurisdictions and, and agencies were, were starting to implement things that would essentially ban labor unions and, and things of that nature. So um, the federal government stepped in and passed the Labor, National Labor Relations Act to kind of fully pave the way for organized labor to be allowed and also put a set of, of rules, regulations, and at the end of the day, rights for workers so that it, it would give them the proper channels if they wish to organize to, to be able to do so. Uh, through the National Labor Relations Board, there, there are kind of two basic functions. The first of which is to oversee the unionization process, those employee rights that I talked about and you know how, how those are involved. So that might be you know, overseeing an election. Uh, if there are complaints that a, a business is interfering unlawfully with, a, with an election, that, that might be something they look into. Um, and then prosecuting violations. So you may be saying to yourself, hey, I, I have a 100% non-union environment. Um, we've never had any sniff of, of union activity here. There's no interest as far as we can tell that uh, our workforce wants to unionize. This doesn't, doesn't apply to me. Uh, and you, you couldn't be more wrong about that. And so what's important to note is that they not only protect active unionization efforts, um, but more so and really in, in an attempt to, to stay, stay relevant and, and perform their, their duties, there's a lot of rulemaking and a lot of cases that they take up that are protecting protecting employees' rights in a way that, if applied in other ways, would be protecting their right to unionize. And, and we'll get into that a little bit further. It's it's hard to explain without going to some specifics, but we'll we will do so. So the National Labor Relations Board is is made up of five members. So there's five people on the board in in normal times. Right now there's a vacancy, so there's four people at the moment. Um, and then, then a general counsel person. So each of these seats, both the general counsel as well as the, the members of the board are selected by the president and have to go through um, Senate confirmation. Uh, and the way that it's uh, designed to be is, is a, basically a three to two ratio in favor of the president's political party. So right now um, with the vacancy and with the next seat expiring, I believe in August, um, right now, it is still a Republican majority at the NLRB, um, but but once President Biden fills that vacant seat and then does a nomination and has it confirmed in August for the outgoing Republican member, uh, after that time, it'll, honestly, it'll probably be sometime in 2022 um, with, with the speed that things happen in Washington. But uh, at that time, then it'll be a three to two ratio, three Democrats and two Republicans on the board. So each member of the board serves a five-year term and it's designed in a way that each year one, one member expires. The general counsel, on the other hand, serves a four-year term. And we'll talk about that in the specifics and how that was kind of flipped, flipped upside down a little bit this year. Um, and I put a note in here just so I didn't forget to mention it, but 
when we talk about the NLRB and cases and stuff that's going to pertain to you, whether you're union or non-union, Section 7 of the Nations Act is, is what comes into play oftentimes. Um, and that's really to, the section of the National Labor Relations Act that protects employee rights. So kind of just reading it verbatim, Section 7 states, employees shall have the right to self-organization, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing, and to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. And it's really that, that last part um, that, that really makes it relevant for all employers, the engaging in other concerted activities. And that's oftentimes what the National Labor Relations Board will choose to take up. So um, it, it might be a case of an employee cursing out their manager and, and storming off and, and didn't have anything to do with a unionization attempt or anything like that. It, you know, it might just be, you know, they were complaining about the, their working conditions or something like that. Uh, oftentimes, you know, if, if a company is uh, disciplining or terminating staff because of them complaining about their working conditions, they view that as chilling to the employee's right. So it might be outside of direct union activity, but because it could potentially chill their rights and, you know, chill their ability to talk about amongst one another their, their working conditions or their pay or whatever, um, then the NLRB tends to get involved. So just a quick look at the, the current statistics. Um, and, and most of this is BLS, and then the chart below is from the NLRB. Um, as of uh, the end of 2020, union membership rate in the United States was 10.8% of workers. Um, and that, uh, as of the end of 2020, was 14.3 million workers in the U.S. Um, considered members of a, of a labor union. So that that number ticked down a little bit, but part of it is due to the pandemic and, and layoffs and job loss. The, the percentage is actually up a little bit because 2019 was an all-time low for union particip participation. Um, it, it, it's been going on a downward trajectory for a number of years um, and, and seemed to have bottomed out in 2019. Uh, again, there was a slight, slight uptick in the percentage last year. Um, it's just the number of workers was, was down again, but because of the pandemic and related layoffs. Public sector is uh, does have the lion's share of, of union participation. 34.8% of public sector workers uh, belong to a labor union, whereas only 6.3% of private, so you know, about five times more in, in the public sector. Looking at the map of the United States, the, the two states with the highest level of union participation are Hawaii and New York, um, whereas the lowest are in the Carolinas. Um, one thing that, that I did find quite interesting in our research for this presentation was in looking at very recent data. Um, while union membership remains low, um, still very close to those all time low levels of, of participation overall. Um, when we look at you know when there is an election taking place, so when a company does decide, or when workers rather decide to explore unionization, I found this this chart here very interesting that over the last four or five months, uh, if you look at October 2020, less than half of the uh, elections voted in favor of a union. And uh, in the, the last couple months, December and January, that, that number was very high. So over 70% over of union elections in, in 2021 ended up with a, with a unionization vote. So definitely a statistic to keep your eyes on. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about the general counsel. So much like the NRB not getting a lot of um, attention, um, a lot of attention also isn't directed towards the general counsel. A lot of times people just look to the board and their rulings, but the general counsel is an extremely powerful position. Um, that, that person oversees and selects which cases the board hears, what they prosecute. Um, sometimes they'll send out a, a memorandum saying that we're looking to review cases from the previous NLRB administration um, and we want to specifically target specific rulings or specific cases um, because we wish to overturn those or re-examine those or something along those lines. So as I said in, in recent decades there's been a lot of doing, undoing, and redoing. So um, 
for instance, the Obama administration was, was very aggressive in um, uh, attacking certain things, handbook policies, um, election rules, things like that. The Trump administration came in and, and their general counsel who you see here, uh, Peter Robb, you know, specifically went after about two dozen of, of the previous NLRB's rulings and, and overturned them or at least seek to overturn them. And then now um, we've got a, a new version of the NLRB that's um, already started to announce some of their agenda and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, something that's really interesting and, and definitely broke, broke, broke president Press precedent, excuse me, was that uh, typically what happens is, is when a, a new president is elected, whoever that existing general counsel is, doesn't generally have too much time left in, in their tenure. Um, and they're usually allowed to, to serve the remainder of that time. Um, interestingly, and not sure of the, the motivation or, or the reasoning behind it, but um, on the day that of the inauguration when when President Biden was sworn into office, he did ask um, Mr. Robb to to resign. He refused to do so, so he was fired from the position. So he was was pretty much immediately removed. His uh, seat was set to expire in November, um, but uh, he is no longer in that seat. Right now, um, there is a veteran of the National Labor Relations Board serving as the acting general counsel. His name is Peter Sung Orr. And um, last month, President Biden did name his nominee for the permanent um, four-year term for general counsel. And, and that person is Jennifer Abruzzo. So this is Jennifer Abruzzo. Uh, currently, she's an attorney for the Communication Workers of America and that union. Um, she, did, she does have a uh, many, many years of experience at the NLRB. Um, she did serve as the deputy general counsel during the Obama administration. And overall, she has 23 years working at various positions within the board. Um, when, when you talk to experts and kind of people in Washington, people in the know, they are expecting a, a lengthy and drawn out confirmation process for, for Jennifer and not necessarily anything to do with her credentials. It's just, um, that firing of, of the previous general counsel uh, did upset some folks. And so um, it is anticipated that uh, they might make it difficult to, to get this person sworn in, but we'll see about that. So in terms of the agenda, we did get um, just a couple of weeks ago, we did get some insight into the, the first items that they're looking to tackle. Um, when a, when a new president takes office, um, they are allowed to name a new chairman of the board. So whoever they want to name as the, as kind of the head from, from their party. So Lauren McFerrin, who is already on the board, uh, one of the Democratic members of the board has been named the chairman. And she participated in a virtual conference at the end of February and, and did kind of state some of, some of their intentions. They talked about um, how they felt that the Trump administration and LRB had really narrowed narrowed the focus and the scope of, of the board and their ability to protect workers' rights to unionize and things like that. So uh, on the other hand, they said they're looking to expand that scope and expand the coverage of activity that they're able to protect. Um, they're specifically gonna look to reverse what's known as the Super Shuttle case. So that was a case, um, Super Shuttle, a kind of one of those airport type shuttle companies. Um, they had a, a case in front of the board where they wanted to allow their drivers to be considered independent contractors. Um, the company won that case, paving the way for them to be 1099 and, and why that's important and how that plays into play with the National Labor Relations Board and the National Labor Relations Act is that once someone's an independent contractor, they're, they're no longer an employee, so they're no longer covered by the National Labor Relations Act. They don't have the right to unionize. They don't have those Section 7 protections or any of that. So they are going to to re look to re-examine that case or find one that's similar that they'll they'll be able to rule on. Uh, she also mentioned wanting to take a look at employee email restrictions that were put into place. So the blast and LRB um, did some rulemaking that allowed employers to prohibit employees from using company email uh, when it had to do anything with with unionization. Um, so they're going to examine that. 
Um, they're also going to take a look at recent rulings regarding employees, you know, displaying or, or wearing pro-union paraphernalia. And they also want to examine and extend the jurisdiction. So there's certain jobs, certain industries, certain workplaces that um, either historically or through previous rulings, um, it's been determined that the National Labor Relations Act does not apply to those. I know, I, I believe there's one in particular they're going to take a look at first regarding um, private, religious um, colleges and universities. Um, but th there are other industries too that historically have been ruled to not apply and, and not be able to unionize uh, a lot with like student workers and things like that. So uh, she did mention that they are going to examine, examine that and um, uh, will undoubtedly look to expand their reach there. So some other potential items based on um, kind of that back and forth that we've seen over the last several administrations. Um, first of which is social me media activity. And, and this is so tricky for employers. And uh, we work with a lot of clients on, on their handbooks and, and their policies or certain situations where an employer stumbles upon something or something is reported to them in terms of what an employee is doing on their personal social media accounts. So uh, that's been a, a really tricky subject to advise on. And uh, I know there are numerous litigation items out there for wrongful termination or you know any number of cases that have to do with an employee social media activity. Um, during the Obama administration, there were some NLRB rulings that really um, gave a lot of autonomy and rights to employees to to have what's called that concerted protected activity or that concerted protected speech via social media channels. Um, but one of the interesting aspects of a protected speech is that to fall under the, the guidance and the rights awarded to people under the National Labor Relations Act, uh, it really has to be conversation between two or more employees. So that's created some really interesting conundrums in the social media space. Whereas if an employee says something, complains about their employer, complains about their working conditions and just posts it on their Twitter account or on their Facebook wall and um, it's just there and there's no interaction with it, uh, there, there may be other legal protections, don't get me wrong, but when it comes to the NLRB ruling on it, that's not protected speech because they're just saying it, they're not having any conversation with a fellow employee. Uh, I remember there was a really interesting case, uh, you know, probably close to a decade ago where uh, someone did that, they posted something on Facebook and one of, there was no comments or no interaction directly in terms of text with one of the other employees, but there was another employee who liked the post. And, and there was a lot of debate over whether another employee liking the post brought that under the, the realm of protected speech and protected concerted activity. Um, so uh, under the Trump administration, they, they gave a lot of leeway for employers to, to act more often on social media activity um, and be a little bit more strict with what would be allowed and not allowed. So uh, we imagine that that's gonna be revisited. Uh, the Trump administration's general counsel and NRB also did a lot to give more leeway to employers for um, disciplining and terminating based on profane outbursts. Whereas the administration before that had said, you know, if it's, if it, even if it's profane, uh, you know, if it's been established that that type of language has, has been acceptable in the past and the outburst had something to do with either unionization or working conditions or complaining about a boss, um, that that would generally be protected. So um, I know they have said that they're gonna look, re-examine that. So um, it's something we'll wanna keep our eyes on. Handbook policies is, is a huge one. And this is especially uh, applicable to all, all employers that who have a handbook, whether or not they, don't have or don't anticipate any union activity. Um, the NLRB from you know eight to ten years ago went hard after handbook policies um, and looking at, at it through the lens of is anything in here too vague or otherwise chilling to an employee's rights. Um, so th they went after things like the employment at will section of a handbook. Does it specifically say when employment at will? You know how how employees can not be employee at will. What does that take? Does it require in, in writing from uh, a corporate executive? Um, you know, what is and isn't employment at will? 
Um, some other policies they went after hard were things like confidential information. If you were too vague and didn't really specifically define what what was considered confidential information, that that might be chilling to employees' rights. Um, certainly, solicitation policies and bulletin board policies and things like that. They they went after those really hard um, and really looked at it with a with a scrutinizing eye. Uh, the the main shift in in the last NLRB was they they did tackle the topic of handbooks and they they kind of said policies fall fall under a few different categories. But what we're going to do is is go under the assumption that looking at a handbook or examining a policy, we're going to go on the assumption that it's lawful and that you know the burden of proof has to be that something in there you know was specific and chilling in a way that uh, it, it takes away that assumption of lawfulness and is shown to have some some intent to to chill an employee's rights. And then finally, <laughs> uh, this isn't a joke, but uh, Scabby the Rat ha has been mentioned. Um, the, the acting general counsel has sent some cases to the regional field offices of the NLB. So I guess um, general counsel Rob had, had gone after the use of Scabby the Rat, and you, um, you've probably seen this if you've driven by a workplace that is in, you know, on strike or in some sort of labor negotiations. You've seen this giant inflatable cuddly little rodent here, our friend Scabby. Um, but there were certain cases where the previous National Labor Relations Board felt it was inappropriate to use. Um, uh, you know, it wasn't within the rights of secondary workers or, or companies that weren't fully on strike yet. So they had sent some orders or some rulings that were limiting the use of, of this prop. And um, the acting general counsel has sent something to all the field offices to, to take away all of those cases and all those rulings and, and allow the use of SCABI uh, <laughs> as was being used previously. So I want to take a, a, a few moments to talk about the PRO Act. And this is definitely a, a touchy subject. I know a lot of um, interest groups and, and lobby groups uh, you know, of different industries and different sizes have, have published a lot about this. Uh, but in case you haven't heard about it, I, I think it's worth mentioning because um, it's definitely something that's on the mind of the NLRB and that they have mentioned it in some of their communications um, because the, this does pertain to them quite a bit. Um, so the PRO Act, as I mentioned at the start, was passed by the, the House of Representatives this week. Uh, it, it does face a, a very uphill battle in, Senate, in the Senate. Um, some experts that, that I've talked to don't, don't expect it to, to go anywhere in the Senate, but, but we'll see. Stranger things have certainly happened. Um, so uh, I did want to make sure everyone was aware of it in case it does get some legs and, and does proceed. Um, it was passed in the House last year as well, but died in committee in the Senate. Um, but, but here are some things that, that pertain to employment and employment law that are in the PRO Act that you know, employers should be aware of should, should this move along and, and in case it does pass. Um, you may have heard of right to work laws. So certain states have what are known as right to work laws that allow union participation and union dues to be optional. So uh, even if it's a unionized environment, workers in right to work states are able to decide whether or not they want to participate in the union. And if they don't, then they don't have to pay the union dues and, and things of that nature. What the PRO Act would do would, would give uh, unions the ability to override those and still collect union dues, regardless of an employee's wishes. Uh, the Act also prohibits what are known as mandatory meetings. So sometimes when there is um, talk about unionization efforts or a, a looming election, a company will hold a mandatory meeting to kind of state their case and try to dissuade workers from voting in favor of organizing. Um, the PRO Act would, would prohibit those mandatory meetings uh, as they're known today. Uh, it would also allow for offsite organization elections uh, it would allow when when there's a new union uh, and they go into the negotiation process. If those negotiations fail, it would give those unions the ability to use arbitration or mediation uh, in those cases to try to come to an agreement. And then it also kind of formally establishes penalties for violations of of employee rights. So, put some numbers behind you know what a company may how how much a company may be liable um, if they violate certain 
rights of the National Labor Relations Act or of this PRO Act, and then also opens the door for personal liability for, by owners and corporate officers. So again, it's not something that's that's passed or um, it, it may not pass at all. I just thought it was relevant to the topic today to, to mention it as something that is currently being discussed in the Senate or will be in the coming weeks. Okay, so it looks like we do have a, a few questions. Um, I'll look to address those. Uh, first, uh, what 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 can we best do to prepare for um, some of this stuff? So, in, you know, I, I would say definitely, again, stay tuned, attend our webinars, keep your eyes peeled for our blog posts and our uh, eBooks and, and, and papers and social media. Uh, again, if you're working with us as an HR services client, we'll, we'll keep you uh, informed proactively and make sure that um, you're prepared should, should any of these things take place or if there's a significant ruling over at the NLRB that that will impact impact you I'd say just keep your your handbook close and be ready to update it as needed should there be policies that need to be reworked or you know uh, new best practices in terms of how a specific policy should be worded um, I'd say certainly kind of identify if you're at high risk for some of these top priority items. Again, if you utilize independent contractors, if you could potentially be in a joint employer scenario, um, you know, just just keep your ear keep keep your ear close and and keep your eyes peeled for developments with this, as um, things could move pretty quickly depending on these rulings. Do we have a date? for the webinar on the stimulus plan in more detail. So I know tentatively we had set it up for April 1st, um, but we're gonna take a look at the schedule and see, um, it won't be any later than April 1st. We'll see if we might be able to, to move some things around and, and perhaps bump that up a little bit once we are able to, to uh, get our hands around that and wrap our heads around it. Um, and then uh, a question about the FFCRA and whether it's mandatory or optional, the, the new one that just passed. Uh, I don't know 100%, but I, I, without reading it and without having it in front of me, I do believe that it's going to be optional. And, and the reason that I think that is because of the piece of it that talks about discrimination rules. So in order for there to be an expectation of non-discrimination and, and not allowing it for some workers and not others, that tends to lead me to believe that it is optional um, because you know if it was mandatory, there wouldn't be, it'd kind of be assumed that there was no discrimination there. It'd have to be open based on the rules of, of the law. But you know if they're giving guidance, telling employers to use it uniformly, then that tends to, to lead me to believe that it's optional. But we will certainly cover that um, in the next session. So uh, it looks like those those are the, the questions that we have right now. Obviously, this isn't something like PPP applications and, and things like that that um, uh, is pertinent, but uh, or that brings about too many questions and specifics, and, and that's quite fine. Uh, looks like we do have one more question coming in. Um, it's just a partial question, but it talks. It says, "Do you know if DUA?" So. Uh, this might have to do and be, and be Massachusetts specific about the division of unemployment assistance. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm going to guess that, that this has to do, I know they did just announce this week that there is going to be a, a two year freeze in Massachusetts on the unemployment um, rate bans because em employers were looking at really, really big unemployment rate increases this year, I think something close to 60%, uh, if they just kind of let the numbers ride as they were, but they did announce they were gonna put a two year freeze on that. Um, oh, it looks like we have a question about subsidizing reimbursable employers for unemployment payments. That I'm not sure of, but um, I'll, take your, I'll take your information down and um, we can get back to you about that. But yeah, no, I did hear it was like, a, I think they said, in 2020 that um, the unemployment claims were equivalent to 15, 15 normal years worth of claims. So obviously it's a, it's a system that's gonna take a while to become solvent again, but um, they are giving some employers some relief, at least in Massachusetts, we'll see what the other states do, um, but there is some, some relief there. But uh, with that, that brings me to the end of today's presentation. I, I thank you so much. I hope that this was a topic that, that you found interesting. It's something that 
Um, sometimes only HR and employment law geeks like myself um, really are really interested in, but it is something that's relevant and something that could impact workplaces and employees of all sizes. So uh, thank you so much for attending and learning, learning a little bit more about this topic today. Um, uh, with that, I'll hand things back over to Jackie. Thanks so much, Paul, for presenting today. We want to thank all of you again for attending this webinar, and we hope that you came away with some helpful information as we navigate the pandemic. If you've been on any of our recent webinars, you already know that MP is currently offering services to help businesses claim employee retention tax credits and maximize their PPP funds. If you would like to learn more about how MP can help with these topics and more, you can email us at marketing at mp-hr.com or schedule a call with us via the follow-up email. If you have any further questions, please send them to marketing at mp-hr.com. We help you stay healthy and have a great day.